Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this morning. We'll give folks a couple more minutes to log on and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hi folks, thanks to everyone who just logged on. We're giving everyone a couple more minutes to um, log on and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, we'll go ahead and get started and let folks hop on um, as we go through these first few slides. Thank you for joining us this morning, everyone, to talk about military hunger among um, military families and veterans. We're super excited to have everyone on the line today. I know that we have some folks on today who do a lot of work with military families and veterans, and we're so excited to have your expertise on the line. Feel free to unmute yourself or put in the chat box at any time if you have anything to add to the conversation or if anyone has any questions to post to. This could be an interactive presentation as we go through. I'll go ahead and shift to the next slide. So before we get started, I know there are a lot of new folks on the line today who maybe haven't heard of the Tennessee Justice Center yet. So we wanted to do an overview of our team and also talk about some of the work that we've been doing recently. So we'll start off just going down the list and introducing ourselves. Um, Signe, do you want to start us off? 
Hi, everyone. This is Signe Anderson. I'm the Director of Nutrition Advocacy at TJC. We're excited to, to talk to everyone today uh, about the intersection of military uh, and veterans uh, when it comes to food insecurity and hunger. Um, thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I, I jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> hey everyone, um, my name is Anna Luttrell. I am uh, the nutrition client advocate at TJC, which basically means I'm doing a lot of casework um, and then using that in turn to help uh, Emily and Signe in former advocacy. Um, and so if you all have any really specific um, policy related questions, especially with SNAP, um, I'm the, I'm the go-to person for those. Uh, and I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat. Thanks, Anna. My name is Emily. I'm a nutrition advocate at the Tennessee Justice Center. I do some casework like Anna, and then I do things with our communication um, and our outreach and trainings like this as well. I'm super excited to have everyone on the line today and to introduce some of our summer interns who have been so helpful and have done a great job with this presentation. We're super excited to, to be here with you all. So Colleen is one of our interns. She's not on the line today, but she does a lot of casework for us, um, and I believe Chandler is on the line today. Do you want to start us off, Chandler? Hi, everyone. My name is Chandler. I am an intern this summer on the nutrition team. I do a lot of PEBT casework, and my kind of main focus has been on hunger among immigrants and refugees and their families. Um, I am going to be a junior at Suwannee, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'll go next. My name is Wade Seifert. I am also a nutrition intern this summer, and my focus has been mostly on college hunger. And this fall, I'll be finishing up at the University of Tennessee with my master's. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Grace Elizabeth, and I'm kind of like Chandler. I do a lot of PEBT casework. Um, and then also, I've been focusing um, my main project on the WIC program. So yeah, I'm really excited to present to you guys today and look forward to speaking with you guys. Thanks all. And I did wanna let everyone know that we are recording live. So if you wanna go back through and watch it, you're welcome to do that or send it to folks who weren't able to make it on the line today. We'll also send out the slides too so you can follow any links or anything that um, are posted. So a little bit about our organization. Our mission is to end hunger in Tennessee by protecting and strengthening SNAP, WIC, and child nutrition programs. We do that through a combination of different work. So like Anna and Chandler and Grace Elizabeth talked about, a huge part of our work is casework. So we help folks who are wrongfully denied from SNAP or help folks who were kicked off of SNAP and don't know why, reconnect to those benefits. Um, we are also doing a lot of PEBT casework right now. Those are benefits given to children who missed out on free or reduced price meals due to virtual learning caused by the pandemic. So that's kind of the base of our work. And then we take what we learn from our clients to identify systemic issues to the programs that we can advocate for positive solutions to. So that's part of our work. The other part is just educating and informing people about changes and updates to the program. There have been so many new things over the past year because of the pandemic. So that's a huge part of our work. And also just giving out basic information about SNAP and WIC and other nutrition programs too. We do that through a combination of communications like social media, flyers, um, resources that we can send out to partners. And we also do webinars um, and trainings like this every month where we can connect with people um, on a certain issue. This month, it's military hunger. Next month, we're doing a WIC 101 webinar that y'all are welcome to join us for. We'll send out some information in an email after this about how to hop on for that. And then the final thing that we do is provide policy expertise um, to our partners on all of these different programs and how we could advocate um, for solutions on a state level, on a federal level, and on an administrative level. 
So that's a little bit about our work. Everyone's welcome to post questions in the chat box um, if you have any anything you'd like to ask. And also, we're always here too. We'll have our contact information at the end. But if you would like to follow up with us, you're welcome to do. I think Emily might be frozen. I've just texted her to see. Um, she might have to turn her video off. Well, it looks like we lost Emily. So let me try to reshare the presentation. Let's pick back up where we left off. You'll give me one second. While Chandler's pulling up the presentation, everyone can feel free to kind of um, drop their names in the chat um, and kind of where you're coming from and yeah, your name. So just feel free to do that while Chandler's, Chandler's working on getting the presentation back up and running. All right, can we see that? Are we back? Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll just kind of continue on and then if Emily um, joins us, she can hop back on. But I think she covered the basics about what we do here at TJC um, and why these trainings are important for the work that we do. So I will go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna start off our presentation by sharing a little bit of hunger and food insecurity data. Um, in the United States. So there's a kind of a subtle distinction between hunger and food insecurity. Um, hunger implies more of like a physical state um, in an individual, whereas food insecurity kind of implicates um, a person's financial ability to buy food for themselves and their families on a, on a consistent basis. So we see that there are 37 million Americans um, experiencing food insecurity in our country. And if you look to figure one on the right, um, you'll be able to see that respondents with children um, are experiencing food insecurity at higher rates than um, respondents without children. So that's one um, point worth mentioning as we move forward and something to remember kind of as we move forward as well. We see in our country that 1.4 million veterans are experiencing food insecurity which is a pretty high number, uh, actually a very high number. We see that there are certain subgroups of veterans who experience food insecurity at disproportionately higher rates. Um, we see black, Hispanic, and non-white um, veterans experience food insecurity at higher rates than their white counterparts. So that's also important to note and remember as we move forward. We see that seven to 18% of military families and veterans have saw emergency food assistance during the pandemic. Um, we all know that the pandemic really um, brought to light and highlighted a lot of vulnerabilities within certain populations and certainly military families and veterans um, was one demographic where we saw where we saw this kind of being brought to light by, by the effects of the pandemic, which is still ongoing. So it's really important to remember these things as we move forward in our presentation. And then, of course, before we keep going, we want to address the intersectionality of hunger. Um, hunger doesn't occur in a vacuum. Right? Hunger is often tied to a multitude of other factors. Um, so it can be caused by and can also perpetuate racial disparities, gender disparities, and other health disparities. It's also important to remember that people who face food insecurity may also face a variety of other issues. So they may struggle with housing insecurity. They may struggle with unemployment. Um, and they also just might not have access to adequate healthcare or healthcare at all. 
So now just to touch on some basics for military hunger. Um, military hunger is something that's often under talked about, under studied, um, but what we do know from a 2020 survey that was done, the Military Family Lifestyle Survey, is that 14% of active duty family respondents reported having low or very low food security. And this figure raised to 29% when we were looking at junior enlisted um, family respondents. And then according to a study that was done by the Minneapolis VA, over one in four post 9-11 veterans report problems purchasing meals or groceries, which is twice the rate of the general population. And then we, like I said, it's something that's really understudied, so it can be hard to get accurate data about because it often is stigmatized, but it's estimated that about 23,000 active duty service members are currently on SNAP or receiving SNAP benefits. And we also know that many um, military bases have food pantries that many, many families rely on in order to have food for not just themselves, but also their families. And then of course, as Grace Elizabeth mentioned, um, the um, state of food insecurity has been heightened by the pandemic. So nearly 40% of active duty families have needed some form of nutrition support since the pandemic. And food assistance has reached the top three most requested needs for the first time in years among military families. Spousal unemployment is also an issue that is um, always pertinent for military families, but we've also seen that it has drastically increased because of the pandemic. So it's gone from about 24% to now over 30%. Um, but one of the potential upsides um, in a really grim situation is that the pandemic may have alleviated some of the stigma around food insecurity, around talking about it and opening up about it for military families because the pandemic was something that's affected everyone. And so it might make the conversation a little bit more easy to approach. So as I mentioned, spousal unemployment is an issue for military families. A lot of times that's due to the frequent relocation that military families experience. And as I said, there's been a significant increase due to the pandemic. Um, another interesting nuance of this is that virtual learning for students has also affected spouses' ability to work because many spouses stay home with the children for childcare um, if they aren't able to go to school. And so that's also inhibited um, um, access to employment. We also know that Spousal unemployment contributes to food insecurity. So about 10% of families um, that have employed spouses are facing food insecurity, but that figure doubles to 20% when we're looking at unemployed spouses. And we also know that childcare, like I um, just touched on, is a top barrier to employment for spouses a lot of times. Um, that hinders their ability to work or work with consistency. And then of course, as I said as well, frequent relocation is really disruptive to professional life. Um, beyond just getting employed, it also prevents seniority in the workplace because with frequent um, moving, it's hard to establish yourself within a career. It leads to consistent unemployment and it really isolates spouses from a wider net of familial support, which um, those um, support systems might be able to alleviate some of the barriers like childcare, but a lot of times they're isolated from those. And then as I also mentioned at the beginning, we see a lot of disparities among different groups, one of those being um, among the lines of gender. And so we see that one in four female veterans face hunger um, and female veterans also face poverty at higher rates at about 10.3% versus at 6.5% um, for male veterans. We know that female veterans are twice as likely as males to be eligible for SNAP benefits. And we also see that female veterans are paid less despite as a group having a higher education level. And in most age groups that are studied, it's about, um, it's over 10,000% or 10,000%, excuse me. It's about, um, it's over $10,000 um, when we're looking at those pay gaps. And um, we also know that women are more likely to be the spouses of active duty members. So when we're looking at spousal unemployment, those are oftentimes disproportionately women that are facing the effects of those. And those disparities also extend when we look at racial and ethnic groups. So we see that about 27% of unemployment, there's about a 27% unemployment rate for spouses of color, but that figure is not as high when we're looking at white spouses, it's about 17%. We also know that veterans of color are twice as likely to live in poverty as the overall veteran population. Um, and of the homeless population among veterans, over half are veterans of color. And then another interesting um, figure to consider is when we look at Native Americans as an ethnic group, they serve in the military at the highest rates per capita. And they also face the highest rates of food insecurity in the US. So again, disproportionate effects for this specific 
um, ethnic group. And then we also wanna consider the effects on children. So hunger has effects on children broadly. It can lead to behavioral issues. It can lead to a difficulty learning. It's hard to focus on your education and on school when you're hungry. It can lead to truancy or tardiness. Um, so there are a lot of effects on hunger for children broadly, but when we look at military children specifically, there are some unique circumstances that they face. We know that one out of three military children at Department of Defense run schools are eligible for for free or reduced price meals. And so we also need to think about the pandemic and remember that those children who might have been virtual lost access to those meals during the pandemic. And then of course the frequent relocation um, affects children as well. So it's really disruptive for children. It's disruptive for their social lives. It's disruptive for their education. Um, and this point here about the NSLP, so children have to apply for the National School Lunch Program, which is what gets them access to free or reduced price meals. And every time they're making a move, they're going to have to be refilling out that application. And that can lead to complications and reduce their chances um, of a seamless ability to get on that program and have access to those free or reduced meals that they might be eligible for. And then also, it's important to consider um, beyond just the obvious issues of food insecurity and hunger, how we could think about this as a national security threat. So if active duty service members are experiencing hunger, they're more likely to have a lower physical performance, they might have a heightened stress level, and they might just be facing distraction or overall concern for their families if the hunger isn't affecting them directly. Um, it could also be affecting their family members more broadly. So this quote here on the left, I think is really powerful. Um, it says, if it says, I won't eat if it means that my kids can eat. My husband is the soldier and he needs the food more than myself as well. So I think this quote is, um, like I said, very powerful and really articulates um, this kind of concept of um, food insecurity being a national security threat for us. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Wade to talk a little bit more about veterans specifically in Tennessee. Yeah, so as Chandler just mentioned, I'm just gonna be going over uh, veteran demographics and just a little bit more specifically on veterans in Tennessee. So in total, we have 422,026 veterans. That data is about two years old though, so those numbers could have changed, but that's roughly 8% of the state population. Um, of that number, back in 2017-18, 54,000 were on SNAP. And then that number decreased to 31,000 the following year. So we actually are seeing a decrease of veterans who are eligible for SNAP being on SNAP. And of the people who are veterans who are eligible for SNAP, only seven and a half percent of them are currently on it. Also, there are 570 homeless veterans currently residing in Tennessee. And the, ah, uh, sorry, 17.5% uh, of veterans make less than 20,000 a year. So uh, there are a lot of veterans currently eligible for SNAP. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the unique circumstances and challenges that veterans may face when returning from duty. Um, I am sure a lot of you are well aware of most of these, but mental health conditions such as depression or PTSD, addictions that they might've picked up while serving the line of duty, cultural changes after returning home, problems with authority, they no longer have an authority figure directing them, that sort of thing. And finding a new career path or locating a home is another serious issue that a lot of veterans face once they return home. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about senior veterans as well as some disabled veterans. So of the 422,000 veterans in Tennessee, 72,000 of them are disabled. So that is 17% of all veterans in Tennessee are disabled. And then the average age is getting up there. It's 58 years old right now, and 37% of veterans are aged over 65, so they're classified as a senior. If you look on the right side of the screen right there, you can see the age distribution of Tennessee and the national averages. So we don't catch up to the national average on 75 and older, but for the rest of it, we are a little bit over the national average as far as age distribution goes. And then I'll just also add here to Wade's point, I think it's really important to talk about um, who makes up the veteran population because we're gonna touch on a little bit later that there are some unique eligibility requirements for SNAP when we're looking at seniors and individuals with disabilities. And so it's important to note that these are um, 
significant populations within the veteran population, both nationally and within our state. And now I would like to turn it over to Ms. Herrera, who I believe is on the line. She works with Operation Stand Down Tennessee, which is a great organization that does a lot of impactful work for veterans. And um, she is gonna share a little bit about, with us about what she does and her experience. Hey everybody, yeah, I'm Terry, and I've been with Operation Stand Down for about three and a half years. I served 26 years in the Air Force. So some of the stuff I'll talk about today is a little bit of my personal observations throughout the years. Um, you guys covered a lot. Um, your stats are uh, really good on, uh, on all the veteran numbers. So that's really good that you kind of set that up for me to talk about. Um, we do have about, I would say about 35% of the veterans that come here um, partake in our food program. What we like to do is um, we kind of have a multi-pronged approach to helping the individuals with their um, food needs. Of course, um, when I first started, we would literally put something out there um, in a newsletter or on Facebook saying, hey, if you got some food. And so like our food bank used to be very small, um, but now we've partnered with uh, Second Harvest and they provide us, they actually got us a, an amazing grant. And so they provide food, which consists of non-perishables, uh, produce, uh, frozen foods. So our food bank has grown exponentially. Um, but then we also, we talk about SNAP a lot. So SNAP uh, folks used to come over to us, um, but they gave us a uh, tablet. And so now anytime somebody comes, we can sign them up on the spot. The nice thing with that is, um, and I'll say this with a caveat, because Chandler was talking about like, you know, males and females and, and the stats and how like the, the eligibility, the 13% versus the 6.5%, um, just a personal observation, but it's important because we see whenever there's disparities, um, it's usually because people just don't want to ask for help. And I feel like women sometimes will ask for help a little bit more than men will. So that is a good number, but there are reasons behind it. Uh, so same. So if they come in and they need um, to sign up for, for a SNAP, if we refer them out to somebody, they're probably not going to do it. So it's been really helpful having access on the spot to get them while they're here. Um, a, another thing we do is, I don't know if you guys have heard of the store by Kimberly and Brad Paisley, we've partnered with them and now we can refer the, to them. And the big thing with that is they have more produce, they have, um, makeup, they have like things that they can get that they just normally can't get. Um, we have got a very detailed, we're going to update it because post COVID it's probably changed a lot but it's probably about a 10 page document and we have it detailed every church, every place that says they have food or a hot meal and we have it by the days of the week. So it's very helpful to say, listen, on Monday, you can look and see what's available on Monday. Um, we, Monday, we start a partnership with Panera Bread where we're gonna get their unsold products. And so we're gonna be able to start giving bread to people. So. We're really trying to grow it because again, like you guys have talked about how it's increased over the um, COVID pandemic. We've seen the same things and more people have actually come to us. Again, uh, the point that Chandler made is, you know, it, it's, it's not such a stigma when everybody's going through it. So more people are coming to us. So we're seeing everything that you guys are saying. Um, every Wednesday, the National Food the Nashville Food Project comes and they bring food. They've been doing that for years and we maintain that we did not miss a beat during COVID for that. Hunt Brother Pizzas, they donate a meal a month. Uh, we have Fool Inns. Uh, we have a partnership with them and they prepare a meal just for our veterans. So they're gonna serve Chinese food today for our veterans. So that's kind of like the direct approach 
like the actual day-to-day -day relief that we're trying to do for our veterans. But in addition to that, we have um, a teach them to fish procedures where, you know, if it's low income, we try to get them employment. If they're just down and out a little bit, we have the SSVF program, which is supportive services for veterans and families. And that's up to a 90 day program where they'll get a case manager. So, you know, even if they have a job, do they need a better job? You know, what are their issues? Is it budget something that we can help them through? So they may be having food insecurities or rent issues or utility issues, but if we can, you know, work on their their day-to-day -day living and what they need and help them obtain it, then those issues hopefully will go away for them. Um, we have transitional housing too. So, you know, especially like some people, they just don't have any money to get into transitional, transitional house. They get a case manager. They can stay into that program for up to two years. So, so yeah, we have our two prongs where we have our day-to-day -day relief and then we have our teach them to fish type of, of procedures. Um, and then we are actually, I don't have all the details yet, but we're trying to create an operation uh, commissary program, which is gonna make it even bigger and better than what we're doing now. So those are kind of some of the things that Operation Stand Down is doing for the veterans who um, have some food insecurities. Anybody have any questions or comments? All right, if there are no questions, then thank you so much, Ms. Herrera. If you any questions do come up, please feel free to put them. Oh, I see one in the chat. Did I just miss it? Wait, let me hop back. Um, I think Ms. Wilson accidentally sent me a direct message instead of a group, um, but question, but um, Ms. Herrera, I believe this is for you. She said specifically, how can Operation Stand Down benefit veterans not in the Nashville area? We have another Clarksville area. So we have a completely separate office that's attached to us. We, um, just because they're in different counties doesn't mean that we don't help them. We still provide assistance. Um, it just varies on what they need, but we do have assistance for other counties. We have people calling us from California. We actually help somebody from Australia. So um, we just do what we can based on their situation. So the easiest thing, if anybody is looking for any kind of assistance is just to call us so we can get their story, we understand what they need and um, help them find resources if it's something we can't do. Are there any other questions? And if anything comes up, I'm sure we can drop it in the chat and circle back to it. Um, Ms. Herrera, thank you so much. Operation Stand Down does amazing work and we're really grateful to have you here on the call today to kind of share about the work you do and the experience you have firsthand. So now we're gonna transition a little bit and we're gonna talk a bit about some of the federal food assistance programs that we can connect military families and veterans to um, in order to address some of these issues and disparities that we have been touching on. So I'm gonna turn it over to Grace Elizabeth to overview a couple of these programs for you all. Yeah, and thanks again, Ms. Herrera. That is awesome work that you guys are doing um, at Operation Stand Down. So I'm sure as, as questions come in the chat, we can all coordinate and um, try to get the best answers out there. Um, but right now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the overview of food assistance programs that are available to military families and veterans. Um, first, we have the SNAP program, which is an acronym for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And this is a food assistance program that provides um, food assistance for low-income Tennesseans. It gives funds to buy groceries um, at authorized retailers that are permitted by the program. Um, in order to be eligible, and Anna, um, we'll touch a little bit more on this a little bit later, but um, in order to be eligible for the program, you must um, meet a certain income requirement. Um, and for active duty military service members, that, that eligibility is determined by um, your base pay plus um, your basic allowance for housing. Um, and it's really important to note here that combat 
pay, hostile fire pay, and imminent danger pay um, are not counted as incomes that determine your eligibility for this program. And so the next program that um, I kind of want to hit on is the pandemic EBT program. This is a new food assistance program that um, was established during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this program supplements free and reduced meals lost because of virtual learning. So um, if students are on the program that Chandler mentioned earlier, the National School Lunch Program, um, then they're eligible to receive free and reduced meals while they're in school. Well, obviously if, if they are in school um, due to the COVID pandemic, then they're at home and they aren't receiving those same meals that they otherwise would be receiving. So the PBT program again, supplements those meals um, lost because of that, that virtual learning. And, and we see that there is definitely a need within military families. Um, Chandler mentioned a statistic earlier that one in three um, children at DOD schools are eligible for free and reduced meals. So that kind of just highlights the need, um, need for programs like PEBT for children of military families. So finally, we have the WIC program, which stands for Women, Infants, and Children. And this is another food assistance program for low income, pregnant and postpartum women, infants and children under five. Um, again, it provides funds to um, eligible recipients um, to buy certain groceries at certain retailers in their area. Um, and then for eligibility, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but for now, I think we can move on to the next slide. All right, I'm gonna go into um, the a little bit of a deep dive into SNAP real quick, like Grace Elizabeth said. Um, so as Grace Elizabeth laid it out very nicely, SNAP is a really um, wide reaching federal assistance um, food program um, that Tennesseans military families will have access, can have access to depending if they're um, income and resource eligible. So before we kind of get into the eligibility um, criteria, it is important to note that um, the SNAP program is not made to completely um, supplement, it's not made to completely replace a family's meal budget, but rather it's um, kind of a supplemental benefit. So you can see in the first bullet point, it totals out to about $1.40 per, per meal. So definitely um, not quite enough money to totally replace your grocery budget, but it can be a really, a really valuable tool for families um, who are struggling to buy food, especially as food prices continue to rise. Um, and we've seen, kind of seen them that been exacerbated throughout the pandemic. That's something we'll keep we'll keep hitting back to. Um, and so SNAP, uh, the way it kind of takes form is on a, an EBT card, which looks essentially just like a debit or a credit card. It can swipe a debit and credit uh, on debit and credit card machines at the store, um, and it's it's a pretty seamless. Um, transaction in terms of um, reducing stigma because of course before before we had snap we had food stamps um, and that was actually like paper stamps um, and that really wasn't that long ago before they transitioned into the um, EBT like debit type cards so that's been a really a really great thing in terms of reducing stigma um, which um, is something we also kind of keep coming back to um, especially for military families um, and then like Grace Elizabeth said, uh, you can use this money um, that's loaded monthly onto your card to buy groceries at authorized retailers, um, which is a really wide sweeping group of stores. Virtually all grocery stores are gonna accept SNAP dollars. Um, a lot of gas stations, Dollar Generals, most stores that sell food are going to um, accept SNAP EBT dollars, and there is a um, there's store locators and things like that where we can we can send out that information afterwards. And then you can also look at the things you can purchase here. We've linked that, but it's it's not very um, it's it's a pretty wide reaching variety of foods that you can buy. Um, you can't buy things like hygienic or hygienic um, and cosmetic items. Um, you can't buy hot prepared foods. Um, but really any groceries, um, produce, anything that's in the aisles, you can buy that with SNAP dollars. Um, and then we have flagged here on the right, um, some, there's a little chart here that's showing a COVID-19 waiver. So we've had several waivers um, throughout the duration of the pandemic that have increased uh, family SNAP benefits per month. So the first one that we have here, the max benefit amount, that's like one of the biggest waivers that we've had for over a year now. Um, and that authorized the state to give every single SNAP household the maximum benefit for their household size, regardless of what they would re normally be receiving um, based on their income. And then we also had a 15% increase to all households that started in January and goes through September. Um, and then we had a boost for families who were already receiving very close to the maximum allotment before the pandemic, just to make sure that they were um, experiencing this um, really great legislation to boost SNAP benefits as well. 
Okay, and now we'll talk a little bit about eligibility. So there are two, very broadly, there are two, um, two kind of big eligibility tests when it comes to SNAP. The first one is based on your income and the second one is based um, on your resources or your assets. So um, your gross income in order to be eligible for SNAP is 130% of the federal poverty line. Um, and we have, you can see on the right hand side here, the, the gross and the net monthly income limits. Um, and just to, um, just to reiterate, the your gross income in terms for SNAP, that's your your pay um, before any deduction, so before any taxes, before um, thinking about taking out things like rent, utilities, um, medical bills, any any of these things that SNAP allows you to deduct. It's your income before that, and then after you deduct all of those things, um, and the SNAP application walks applicants through that. Uh, the net income must be less than uh, equal or less than a thousand. Or, sorry, hundred percent of the federal poverty line. So that's the first half of SNAP eligibility, and then the second half is the asset test. So for most households, this is going to be um, in order to be eligible eligible for SNAP, you have to have less than two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars in assets, um, and this is things like money in the bank, uh, property other than your home, certain retirement accounts. If you're um, if you're interested in kind of getting the full list of things, just email me and I'll, I'll send that out. Um, but then there are a few special considerations for elderly and disabled clients, which we'll, we'll go into in a few minutes, um, but that's going to move the asset test up a little bit to 3500 for those families and then also allow a couple other things, which, like I said, I'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, and then also we just want to reiterate that um, homelessness does not disqualify uh, an individual from participating in SNAP. Uh, the SNAP application can be maybe a little bit intimidating to folks experiencing houselessness because it does ask for um, an address, but that doesn't have to be a permanent um, address. That can be an address of a friend or a family member or a trusted organization where um, they can receive mail notices and their SNAP card out. Um, so that's that's definitely something that we try to flag because um, it's a misconception that folks think um, because they don't have a permanent address, they cannot receive SNAP. And here's just a little bit of information on how to apply. You can apply online, um, we've linked it here, uh, or you can do a paper application. Most of the SNAP offices are, in fact, I think all of them are still closed except for by appointment only. Um, so the online application has been huge throughout the pandemic. Uh, and if you all want more information on that, just let us know. And then um, there's a few steps on kind of how the application goes. It's basically divided into four parts. After you submit like the physical, either online or paper application, there's an interview component, um, some paperwork that needs to be submitted. And then uh, in 30 days, uh, any applicant will get a decision. And there's a little uh, bit about documents to have on hand, some typical things that DHS will request from applicants just to verify their income and their deductions and different things like that. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about WIC eligibility. I kind of hit on what the program was, and now I'm going to talk about kind of some things that would make a person eligible. So first, Anna kind of gave a good um, overview of what a gross income is, and for WIC, that gross income has to be equal or less than 185% of the federal poverty line. And then um, for WIC, you have automatic income eligibility if you're participating already in the SNAP program, if you're on Families First, or if you are on TenCare. So if you're on any of those programs, you're automatically income eligible um, for WIC. And there are a couple of other requirements that you would need to meet, but that's, that's definitely a big one right there. Um, the next one is a residential requirement. Um, applicants must be Tennessee residents in order to receive WIC from um, the state of Tennessee. Um, there is a categorical requirement. So you must be a woman, you must be either pregnant or postpartum, um, you must be an infant or a child under five. Um, and this is a really, it can kind of get confusing right here because some people, when they see women, infants and children, they aren't thinking about um, fathers, but fathers can definitely apply um, for these programs for their um, children under five or for their infants. So it's, um, it's a pretty versatile, in that regard, as long as they meet these other these other requirements that I have listed here. Um, and then finally, um, you must be deemed to be at nutritional risk, which is something that a dietitian, a nutritionist, um, or a doctor will um, determine when you go to your appointment to apply. Maybe you can move to the next slide. Okay, so how to apply to WIC. So because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you, we've been able to apply over the phone for the WIC program, which is really 
um, apparently increased the participation in the program, which is so great um, and something that we are hoping maybe to continue after after the pandemic is over. Um, so all services are being done by phone right now, but as we see maybe um, kind of a light at the end of the tunnel regarding the pandemic, um, you'll have to schedule an appointment to um, go to your, your WIC appointment and, and they'll determine your eligibility and things like that there. Um, and then right here, I have a link listed to county by county contacts to Tennessee WIC clinics. So um, you can find your county and then find your corresponding, find the corresponding number um, that is best for you to call to, um, to schedule that appointment or um, yeah, that's, that's about it for this slide. And then, okay, so how programs can help. Um, we see SNAP is a, obviously a, a super great program. Um, it provides a lot of nutritious food assistance for, for tens of thousands of people across the state, but especially we see that there are 31,000, uh, over 31,000 veterans being served um, overall. And then um, we see the PEBT program kind of like I highlighted earlier. We see that there's definitely a need um, as one in three children at DOD schools are eligible for those free and produced price meals. So um, that statistic right there just demonstrates how these programs can be really useful for families when they're, um, when they're buying food um, for themselves and for their, for their children. So then um, the WIC program, it's, it's a little bit more accessible than the SNAP program. Um, the Government Accountability Office found that um, it may be easier to qualify for WIC over SNAP because WIC allows state agencies to exclude certain portions of a service member's pay, whereas SNAP um, doesn't really do that. And then another benefit that we see of WIC is it really promotes healthy habits among families. So if a child grows up seeing her mom um, buying healthy foods that are um, supported by WIC, um, he or she is more likely to do so for themselves and for their families in the future. And then also WIC provides medical assistance for women, it provides breastfeeding support and lactation services. So those are two great um, additional benefits of being on the WIC program. So how to connect families. So right here, I have a couple of links for the SNAP. It's um, the SNAP program. First, I have some eligibility requirements linked here. Um, which is just some raw numbers that you can associate with your household size and income. Then I have the store locator um, also linked. Um, and this is just um, an, a link to a site where you can input your address and it will show you um, stores in your area that accept SNAP benefits. And like Anna said, that's going to be most stores that sell groceries. Um, and then finally, I have a how to apply video. Um, it's a video done by Anna and it's really, it's a really great um, resource for families who are looking to apply for the program. And then for PEBT, I just have um, some eligibility requirements linked. Sometimes it, as the pandemic has evolved and as we're kind of um, nearing a new school year, it has some just more in-depth eligibility requirements for that program and what it means for families. Um, it's also important to note that um, there are two other PEBT programs. One is the summer PEBT program. Um, and for that, a child just needs to be enrolled in um, a K through 12 child just needs to be enrolled in the National School Lunch Program. And then for children under six, there is also a P PEBT available. And to be eligible for children under six, um, obviously, you need to be a child under six and you need to be in a household that participates in the SNAP program. And you also need to live in a district where one school has shut down or um, operated at reduced hours due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then finally, moving on to the WIC resources I have listed here, um, just kind of another store locator, similar to the SNAP store locator listed above. You, again, you type in your address and it will show you um, grocers that accept WIC EBT. And then finally, I have the WIC eligibility tool, which is a really useful tool. It kind of is a, it's a site where um, you're asked a couple of questions um, and then at the end of that questionnaire, it determines whether or whether or not um, you're, you would be eligible for WIC. So that's also a useful resource before you schedule an appointment just to kind of get a baseline of, of where you stand. Then I'm also just going to add, um, Anna and Grace Elizabeth have done an amazing job of reiterating that um, SNAP and WIC benefits can be, and PBT benefits can be used at a variety of different locations and military 
commissaries are not off limits when we're talking about locations that those benefits can be used. So just wanted to make sure I flagged that for everyone. Yes, thank you, Chandler. It's really a definitely a good a good variety of of stores that you can use those benefits. So finally, we um, I kind of wanted to talk about some barriers to the SNAP program. Um, we we see both systemic and social barriers, but first I'll kind of go over a couple of systemic barriers. So one barrier that we see is that the basic allowance for housing is counted as income when determining um, SNAP eligibility. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what that is, but I'll kind of just go over it just for the sake of it. Um, the basic housing allowance or allowance for housing is um, a stipend that's given to families who are not living in subsidized housing on base. So if they're living out in their local communities, they would receive this um, in order to pay for housing. And the fact that this um, allowance for housing is counted as income when determining SNAP eligibility, that means that a lot of people who um, receive this are disqualified from receiving SNAP. So that's kind of a barrier that we've that that's really big and that that we've talked about a lot. And then um, we also see some procedural confusion with applicants. Obviously, the SNAP application can be hard to access. It can be hard to navigate. Um, and we also see some geographic confusion. For example, Fort Campbell, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, but it's right on the Tennessee and Kentucky border, which can kind of cause confusion regarding which state you are supposed to receive those SNAP benefits from. And because of that confusion, a lot of people um, think that they're ineligible for Tennessee benefits when they might be or vice versa. And then moving on to some social um, barriers, we see a lot of, like we've all, I think we've talked about a little bit, um, prior, but there's a big stigma with receiving benefits, um, any benefit, but um, SNAP particularly, because uh, military families and veterans have kind of been reared in a culture of resilience and strength. And so asking for help can kind of seem scary um, or overwhelming. So it's really important that we talk about these programs and we talk about accessibility and we talk about the number of people who do participate in these programs to kind of alleviate that stigma. Um, and allow more people to know about the program and to apply. Awesome. Okay, so now, as promised, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some unique SNAP eligibility for applicants who are either senior, which for SNAP purposes means over the age of 60, or who have a disability. Um, and we really wanted to highlight this information because um, most of our vet, many, a large percent of our veterans are going to fall into this uh, population of either being over the age of 60 or um, having a disability. And so um, I will flag too that um, to be considered disabled for SNAP purposes, this can be by the Social Security Administration or by the VA. Um, so it doesn't have to just be the SSA, um, which sometimes can be a misconception. If you're disabled per the VA, then that will qualify you um, for this unique SNAP eligibility, which can oftentimes um, kind of make it easier for these folks to get on SNAP. Um, and so there's kind of three big things to cover here. The first one is that um, seniors and individuals with disabilities do not have to meet the gross income limit. Um, and this can be really important for a reason we're going to get into next, um, which is the medical deduction piece of this. But um, this can really help folks who, who have like really high medical expenses um, and might, might not normally qualify for SNAP because they would not meet that gross income limit. But once you take into account um, medical expenses and these, these bills that they're paying every month for prescriptions or insurance, co-pays, what have it. Um, they don't have a lot of money left over for a grocery budget, and so they would meet the net income limit. Um, and so those folks are only held to the net income limit um, in order to determine their eligibility, which leads me into the next big thing. Um, seniors and individuals with a disability are allowed to deduct, deduct medical expenses from their income. Um, and the list of medical of, of countable medical expenses um, for the SNAP application is pretty expansive. Of course, it's covering things like insurance, premiums, um, doctor co-pays, prescription costs, things like that. Uh, but it also covers unpaid medical bills, with it, which is a really, really big one, um, especially um, kind of we have a lot of uninsured people uh, in, in Tennessee. So um, that can be that can be a huge one. A lot of our clients will have very large medical bills and then uh, that can help make them eligible for, eligible for SNAP if they would not otherwise um, have that expense. It can also be things like um, if someone's paying for oxygen or if they've bought um, a wheelchair or a walker, things like that. We can pass around a flyer that has kind of a, 
a more expansive list of what counts for the medical deduction. Um, but we're always we're always hammering home that this is a really, really, um, it's something that if, if applicable to senior and disabled clients um, is really great to try to get onto that application because it can really increase their chances of um, being eligible for the program. Um, and then the last thing I'll touch on too is that uh, senior and disabled applicants have less strict um, household composition requirements. So SNAP considers a household of people, uh, a household to be a group of people who are um, kind of broadly speaking, paying for food together, I um, mean, who live in a singular residence. But as we know, sometimes um, there can be people that live in the same house and they're not necessarily paying for food together. A really great example um, is if uh, maybe you have a family and their grandmother is living with them. And let's say she's receiving SSDI or something like that for her income. And she is paying for her food separately from uh, her other family, um, but maybe they still are, you know, helping take care of her um, and to help her prepare her food. Maybe they're even going to the store and buying her food for her with her money. Um, she could still be your own household. Whereas um, with non-senior and disabled clients, the, the restrictions are a little bit more limiting in terms of how food um, needs to be prepared and purchased. But for seniors and, and clients with a disability, as long as that food is being paid for separately, um, as long as those finances are separate, if they're in the same house, uh, they can be treated as their own household, which can really, um, that can really help eligibility too, um, especially if maybe the, the families, if you included their income on her application, that might make them uneligible, or that might make her uneligible. Anna, I'm gonna, yeah, Chandler, go ahead. Sorry, Grace Elizabeth. I was just going to point out this question in the chat and see if you knew it off the top of your head. Of course, if not, we can follow up. But Ms. Herrera asked if a VA disability determination um, no, let me just read your question directly so I don't get it confused. Is an acceptable VA disability determination the awarded VA disability rating or do they need something from a physician? I'm gonna, I, I'm pretty sure it's the awarded VA disability rating. We'll follow up with that, um, but I, I'm pretty sure that's it because I've, I've helped a few veteran clients um, apply before and we didn't, for the documents that we submitted, we didn't submit anything from a physician. We submitted it from the document from the VA. Um, and it was it went through and was accepted. So, but we'll double check and I'll I'll make sure. Thanks, Anna. Okay, so um, finally we have some advocacy and policies to flag, specifically some legislation that was brought forth by um, Tennessee's own Marsha Blackburn um, and Senator Tammy Duckworth, who is a um, retired lieutenant colonel in the. Let me make sure I get this right. In, in the Army National Guard. So what this act would do would address, would more broadly address food insecurity within military families. Um, one, by creating a basic needs allowance. So this would kind of just be money given to families and part of that money would be um, to buy things like groceries. And then a big one that, that we really are supporting is, we're, we're supporting the whole thing, but this one is definitely would be a big change to um, being determining eligibility for SNAP and allowing a lot more people to get on the program. It would be eliminating the basic allowance for housing requirement. Um, so no longer would people have to include that um, allowance as income for SNAP. So that would that would allow tens of thousands of people to to get on the SNAP program, which would be great for um, for our active duty military families and service members. And again, it's co-sponsored by um, Tennessee's own Marsha Blackburn. So that's also something that we're, we're excited about. You can go ahead. Yeah, so moving forward, some steps for action would be to reach out to your legislators and your representatives and tell them that you support the Military Hunger Prevention Act. This could be something like writing a letter, sending an email, um, or calling their office. I'm sure they'd be open, um, open to talk about that with you and um, what it would mean for our veteran and military family communities in Tennessee. Um, you can also join our SNAP access calls like we had mentioned at the beginning of this call we, we do these every month and they're really informative and obviously um, going to be changing a lot as we we see new developments in the pandemic and um, requirements for certain programs. Next, um, connecting military fa families and veterans with the SNAP application um, is a really big action point that we're really advocating for, like Ms. Herrera and her organization, Operation Stand Down. She was talking about how they are able to sign people who come, come to them for help 
sign them up for SNAP right there on the spot. And we think that's that's a great step, um, great step in the right direction for um, engaging these populations with SNAP and allowing them to have access to these, these great resources. Um, finally, we can kind of find ways to engage with service members and veterans. So volunteering at your local food bank or any place that you know where service members and veterans are served, um, volunteering there is a great way to get to know them and kind of better understand their personal struggles and things that they might be going through. Um, and then finally, just learning more about military and veteran hunger in ge general. Um, obviously, <laughs> educating yourself can never be a bad thing. And, and knowing more about this can kind of help alleviate the stigma um, that you might feel or that they might feel within themselves. So yeah, those are, those are our steps for action here. And I think we're going to move into some questions. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourselves and ask out loud or drop them in the chat and then we'll all be available as well as Ms. Herrera to, um, to answer those. I know it can be hard sometimes to come up with answer or questions on the top of your head. So if there is anything, we have Signe's email there, um, Emily's email there as well. And you can um, reach out to either of them with any questions for us. Um, Anna as well would be happy, I'm sure, to answer plenty of questions about SNAP and its nuances, which can be kind of complicated. Um, so if anything comes up in the future, please do not hesitate to contact us. And like we had mentioned at the beginning of the call, we're going to send out this PowerPoint as well as the recording so you can access those linked resources. Um, and we'll also send answers to um, Ms. Herrera's follow-up questions as well as any other questions we receive in the meantime. Um, but yeah, that was, that was our presentation. Thank you guys so much for coming and um, we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.